A few weeks ago, I posted a poll on my community page, and the overwhelming majority of you wanted to review all 18 of the dividend-specific ETFs. There's 18 ETFs that have a total assets under management of $1 billion plus. So over the next few weeks, I'm going to do an in-depth review of each one of those ETFs. So the list here in alphabetical order starts with today's ETF, which is Degro. If you want to get notified whenever the next ETF video comes out, uh, you can hit the subscribe button down below and turn the little bell icon on and it will notify you whenever a new video is out. Also, I'm going to put these into a playlist. So I'll put a link right up here to the playlist. So if you're watching this a couple weeks later and I've gone through all the ETFs, you can watch all 18 of those right there. Part one, we're looking at the iShares Core Dividend ETF. Ticker symbol is Degrowed. This video, we're going to touch upon the quick introduction. So we're going to look at what is Degrow's dividend yield, its fees, other just basic metrics. Then we'll get into the meat of the strategy. So each of these ETFs tracks an underlying index. And so that index has a specific strategy that it follows. So we'll look at that, how that underlying index for Degrow selects its stocks then we'll look at very important risk. So how does Degrow perform in down markets like the most recent, uh, you know, 2020 COVID crisis? How did Degrow do then? Uh, also the holdings. So what stocks and sectors does Degrow own right now? Uh, and then we'll look at a couple valuation metrics. So how does the stand, the underlying holdings stand on PE, price to book, price to sales? and also the earnings growth of the underlying holdings. And then finally, at the very end of the video, we'll look at performance. So how has Degro, the ETF, performed since inception? We'll also look at how the underlying index for Degro has performed. Uh, I've done a couple of videos now on looking at performance of different ETFs, and constantly people say, well, wait a minute, how did you find that performance? All I see is, you know, going back to 2014 or 2012. Well, the key is you have to look at how the underlying index that Degro tracks or another, another ETF tracks, that's where you'll find the performance of that index. And it gives you a much better idea of how it has performed going back to, in this case, 2003, whereas Degro only goes back to 2014. So that's at the very end of the video, so stick around for that. So first, just a few quick facts. This ETF tracks the Morningstar US Dividend Growth Index. So we're gonna spend a lot of our time analyzing how that index works, because that's really the driving factor for Degro. The asset under management right now is 11.42 billion, so it's a pretty decently sized fund. The current dividend yield is 2.5% and a very impressive 0.08 expense ratio. Next, we're gonna look at the strategy that Degro follows. So this is the Morningstar US Dividend Growth Index construction process. So they start with a universe of securities from the Morningstar U.S. Market Index, which is bigger than the S&P 500, so it's including um, a lot more securities than just the large cap. The security selection, um, they actually take the top 10% dividend yield, so they say, you know, rank them from, say, there's a thousand stocks that make it through. They're taking the top 10% dividend yields and deleting them from the universe. So it's uh, eliminating those higher yield and often higher risk investments. Um, the dividend income must be qualified. So that excludes uh, REITs and other securities that pay non-qualified dividend income. Uh, the companies have to have at least five years of uninterrupted dividend growth with a slight caveat, which we'll talk about in a second. 
the, all the stocks must also have positive consensus earnings forecasts, meaning they're going to make money next year is the expectation, and their payout ratio must be less than 75%. So all the stocks that make it through these criteria will ultimately end up in the Morningstar U.S. Dividend Growth Index. So a couple other strategy details. Like I said, REITs are excluded because of the qualified income restriction. The payout ratio, meaning uh, whatever the dividend is divided by the earnings, both of those are actually forward-looking. So it's taking the next 12-month dividend expectation, what analysts expect them to pay, divided by the forward 12-month earnings expectation, what the analysts expect them to earn, and that has to be less than or equal to 75%. And then also, if a, if a holding fails to increase the dividend, so this is the five-year dividend uh, criteria, if a company fails to increase the dividend, they can still remain in the index, but they have to be net share repurchasers over the last year. So kind of incorporating a little bit of a shareholder yield concept, which I, I really like that about this particular index. The weighting here is interesting. So most indices are weighted by market cap. So as the price per share increases, uh, the market value of the company increases, the overall weighting in the index also increases. This actually rewards companies who are paying more dividends. So if a company raises their dividend by, say, 20%, they're going to get a 20% higher weighting in the index. It is based on total dividends, so the stocks that pay out the most nominal dollars are going to be, you know, Apple, of course, even though the yield is relatively small, they're making a ton of money and they're paying out a very large total dollar, dollar value in dividends, so they're going to get a very large weighting. Uh, and then the, the weightings are also capped using Morningstar's 5350 system. Uh, and basically what that means is simply they don't want, you know, one stock to exceed 5% of the overall portfolio. They don't want one specific sector uh, making up more than 50% of the index. Um, I'm not sure what this three stands for. Uh, tried to look into that, couldn't find any information on that, but they are capping these uh, so that it doesn't become too concentrated in one or two different stocks uh, or one or two different stocks. Now we'll talk about the risk of the portfolio. Uh, so this is from Morningstar's page. It gives us some data on the fund here. So this is Degrow. The category is value, so large cap value. And then the index they're looking at is the Russell 1000. So again, this is a value comparison. Um, so the beta here is not like you would normally see it relative to the S&P 500, um, but it is a little bit lower of a beta relative to the value index, uh, which is good. Beta just means you know for every 10% increase, this fund will generally increase by 9.5%, and for every 10% decrease, it will decrease by 9.5%. Um, so generally speaking, this is a lower risk fund relative to a traditional value fund. This upside downside capture ratio is also a pretty interesting way to look at risk. So the 94 just tells you that this fund generally captures 94% of the upside relative to the value index, but it captures 100% of the downside. So again, that's not particularly great. You'd rather see it flip. You'd rather see it capture more upside than downside. In my opinion, this is the most important risk metric. Uh, we don't necessarily care about volatility, or I don't. I don't think you should either, as long as it's upside volatility. We don't want to penalize the stock 
for going up a lot and having, you know, 40% volatility, as long as it's going up 40%, that's positive. What we want to say is what is the, the maximum drawdown, right? That is really what we're looking at top to bottom. How much has this fund historically declined and how does that compare to other choices? So you can see that the category and the index are both right around 26.5% maximum drawdown. Now that was actually in 2020, so this year, from January 1st to March 31st, this fund only dropped by 22%. So on a top to bottom drawdown basis, this fund is actually does a pretty good job of reducing risk. Uh, so now we'll look at which stocks and sectors this fund owns right now as of August 2020. Uh, so here we've got a breakdown of all the different sectors. These are according to the way Mar Morningstar categorizes them. So you may see this a little different depending on which website you're looking at. But again, we're comparing relative to the value value funds. So you can see the weightings here are, are fairly similar across the board. You know, as we talked about earlier, this fund does not own any REITs because they're non-qualified income. So this is basically zero. Uh, communication services is another one where you've got a decent disparity between the fund and the category. Uh, the reason there is most likely that a lot of these communication services stocks have not paid or raised a dividend very long. So that's one reason there. The energy sector, you've had a lot of dividend cuts over the last five years. So this is quite a bit lower than the, the index. Similar industrial weight. Technology is quite a bit higher than the value index. Now keep in mind the S&P now I believe is around 25 to maybe even 30% technology. So you're still quite a bit less exposure relative to the S&P 500, but compared to similar value funds, it's, it's, quite, it's a little bit higher. Defensives are a little higher, but similar. Healthcare is basically identical as are utilities. Here are the top holdings in Degro right now. So again, these are weighted by total dividends paid. So of course, Apple paying the most total dollars in dividends is the number one overall weighting at 3.7. Then you have Microsoft, they're coming in at number two. Verizon, Johnson & Johnson. Now we'll look at the performance of the Degro ETF and its index. So here first is the ETF. So year to date, this fund has had a negative 2.3% total return, which is actually significantly better than both the large value funds and the uh, Russell 1000. So these are, are noted here as plus or minus. So if this is positive, it means it's outperformed by this percent. This has outperformed the average large cap value mutual fund by 6.6% this year. All of these numbers are positive out one year, three year, and five years. So this five year number is actually pretty impressive. 11.6% has beaten the large value funds and the index by about five and a half to six percent per year, uh, which, is, which is quite impressive. Here it shows you the percentile rank, so if it's in the a lower number is better. So you can see here that over the last five years, this has ranked in the top 2% of large value funds. Performance for Degro is, is pretty impressive. Now we'll look at the index performance, so we can get back a little bit further than when the uh, Degro was started. Morningstar US Dividend Growth Index actually has back-tested data using that same methodology going back to December 19th of 2003. So if we look at how it's performed since then, the Morningstar US Dividend Growth Index is up 350%, compared that to the S&P 500, which is up 334%. So since 2003, this methodology would have slightly outperformed the S&P 500. I think this is a great, a great fund, really, for a core holding. The index is weighted by dividends instead of market cap. That gives it a little bit more of a value tilt. I put the exact same thing at, over on the cons list because by weighting by dividends and not weighting by market cap, 
you're, you're tilting more towards value, which means you're generally tilting away from momentum. And as you guys know, if you follow my channel, I'm a big fan of momentum. Both value and momentum have historically outperformed the market. So you're doing good here by leaning more towards value. You're just getting away from momentum, which is also uh, done well. So it's a bit of a trade-off there. This does avoid the highest dividend yielding stocks, which means it's avoiding a lot of the really high risk stocks like most dividend stocks that have a high yield are that way for a reason it is well diversified so there's about 418 holdings i believe it's also very low cost at eight basis points the con with having 400 different stocks is that you're really not concentrated enough to outperform the s p 500 long term um, that may not be your objective, so maybe that's fine for you. You just want diversified access to dividend stocks. This is a great way to do it. The con, if you're trying to beat the beat the S and P, is that if you own basically the entire S and P 500, so if you own 400 stocks, you you aren't really making big enough bets on specific companies to really have that much of a difference between the performance of the fund and the performance of the the S&P 500. So you're probably not going to beat the S&P long term. This is a core diversification holding. That's that's really where its strength is. And then the last negative, and this is a, a bit of an unknown at this point, but since it's using the forward payout ratio, so forward dividends and forward earnings, the COVID crisis has really collapsed a lot of the earnings expectations for stocks. So what you're getting right now is a lot of companies are going to have a forward payout ratio that's over 75%. Now that should be a temporary drop as we move past this and the economy starts to recover. We should see, see that um, be alleviated. But right now, it could be a bit of an issue. So I don't know how the fund, how the index is going to handle that. Um, so that's a little bit of a, a concern, at least in the very near term. Mm -hmm.